OK, colleagues, the next item of business is a statement by Jenny Goldruth on future of Scottish ferries. The Minister will take questions on the issues raised in her statement uh, afterwards. There should be therefore no interventions or interruptions. And I call on Jenny Goldruth uh, for around 10 minutes, Minister. Presiding officer, every time a vessel has a fault, every time a service is delayed, every time a sailing cannot be made, lives are affected. I want the Chamber to be in no doubt today about how seriously I am taking this Government's response to the challenges presented by the delivery of services on the Clyde and Hebrides ferry network. Things have got to improve for our island communities. Presiding officer, Project Neptune represents a key opportunity to bring about the necessary rigour and focus required to deliver those improvements. Now, I committed to publish the report in Parliament earlier this year. A full copy comprising of sections on governance and on future thinking has been placed in SPICE for all members to access today. For absolute clarity of purpose, my statement today will focus only on those services delivered in the west of Scotland by the CalMac fleet. And I will consider some of the learnings from Neptune, the necessary challenge to government, and set out a way forward which will look to work with all parties across this chamber and fundamentally to better meet the needs of island communities. Now, we are time limited today, presiding officer. Therefore, it is my intention to return to the chamber for a full debate on what that future delivery should look like. Project Neptune considers, within an international context, recommendations for improvement in the current arrangements for delivery of ferry services in the west of Scotland. There is much in the current arrangements that delivers well, but there are clearly actions for government too. In summary, Neptune highlights the need for a statutory framework on the governance of ferries. Secondly, the tripartite structure is challenged. Thirdly, the report calls for improved vision and leadership to develop that long-term strategic planning and improved collaborative working. Project Neptune is an extremely technical report, and I appreciate that members will not have had a chance to fully digest all of that detail this afternoon. To that end, I want to make an offer to all members today that Transport Scotland will host a session with Ernst & Young, who wrote the report, to explain it in further detail. Before today's statement, I met with all stakeholders who might be affected by any changes in the future. And I want to give them an absolute assurance today that there will be no takeover imposed on any one organisation. But government must improve the delivery of ferry services on the Clyde and Hebrides network. We need a better culture of collaborative working to meet the needs of our island communities. Presiding officer, the tripartite structure, CalMac, CMAL and Transport Scotland, was brought in at the time by the then Scottish Executive to comply with EU law. And Project Neptune, not unhelpfully in my view, evidences what that can sometimes mean in practice when the tripartite does not agree, for example. The report notes challenges in holding the tripartite to account due to confusions over roles and responsibilities. It also points to a lack of a formalised process for ministers to engage with the tripartite. That needs to change. The second part of the report evaluates different approaches to bringing together organisations that deliver ferry services. It considers the introduction of a ferries commissioner, but notes that that innovation could bring another stakeholder to an already crowded sector. The report sets out a range of potential options for reform. Presiding officer, the First Minister has been absolutely clear that we will not consider unbundling or privatisation, and the report sets out some of the reasons why that would not be pursued in further detail. Alongside improving existing arrangements, I'm open, though, to exploring what improvement could result from more formal integration. Now, clearly, it would not be right to announce any changes without community consultation. But we also need to be cognizant of the organization, organizations rather involved in service delivery today. Now, a key part of the next steps will therefore involve staff directly at CalMac, CMAL and DML, and of course, the relevant trade unions. Presiding officer, I am a mainlander. Like many of us, my family's roots can be traced back to Bimbecula, Isla and to Arran. But I don't need to take a ferry to my work. I don't need to take a ferry to the food shop. I don't need to take a ferry to a family funeral. These services are lifeline services. So my commitment today is to reform how we deliver these services with the central guiding principle that our island communities have to be part of what comes next. 
So I can announce today that we will consult directly with island communities on next steps. And I am pleased to update the Chamber that Angus Campbell, who is currently Chair of the Ferry Community Board, has agreed to lead this vital work. Angus brings with him a wealth of experience and I look forward to working with him. Presiding officer, since January, I've spent a great deal of my time uh, with the unsung volunteers who give up their time to be part of ferry committees. And whilst they might not all agree on how services are delivered, they are all united in seeking better ferry services for their communities. It's a simple ask and this government and the organisations which run ferry services on our behalf need to do better at engaging with, at listening to and at acting on the needs of island communities. We also need to ensure that these organisations are representative of the communities that they serve. To that end, I'm delighted to confirm today that Morag McNeil will take up position formally as the Chair of Caledonian Maritime Assets Limited. Morag will be the first woman to hold the uh, role of Chair and I look forward to working with her. Neptune also requires action from government. So I can announce today that we will re-establish and refresh the Islands Transport Forum. That will focus initially on ferries provision and island resilience. I will chair the forum, but it will also involve regular attendance from the Cabinet Secretary for Rural Affairs and Islands and the Cabinet Secretary for Justice and Veterans, who has responsibility for resilience. That has to ensure that cross-government approach, which I think is absolutely vital in terms of next steps. And for every period of prolonged disruption, I will convene a resilience group with the Ferries Community Board, CalMac and local partners so that government's response at a national and a local level reflects the scale of the impacts that the loss of a lifeline service can have on our island communities. Accountability also matters. As part of the consultation on the island's connectivity plan that will take place later in the year, measurable performance indicators are going to be developed they will be distinct from those contractual targets and they will better reflect the real experience of passengers. They will be visible and they will be published, against which we can monitor, of course, performance. But they will also help to progress regaining communities' trust in our services. And, of course, I will fully consider and respond to any recommendations which come from the Public Audit Committee and Net Zero Energy and Transport Committee reports. Presiding officer, I know that island communities may be anxious about the winter, the beginning of this year brought some of the most unpredictable weather ever experienced and it directly impacted on service delivery. To help reduce the number of delays and cancellations related to weather, the government will expand the tide and weather monitoring equipment currently in place at Seamal ports to third party ports. Ministers also need to ensure that we are deriving full public value from every penny and pound invested in our ferries. Now, currently, there's a real lack of transparency about the application of harbour dues. There is no clear mechanism that guides harbour dues increases and there is an expectation that government will always fund repairs, maintenance and enhancements, even when we do not own the harbours. This year alone, the government has invested or will invest rather £40 million in ports and harbour services. So I want to explore with relevant local authorities and other third party owners how we can improve matters. And as part of the island's connectivity plan, I will set out that long-term investment programme for vessels and ports that Neptune calls for and islanders need to see. Presiding officer, in conclusion, I want to thank everyone who works for us, in David McBrain, in Seamal and CalMac, and to my officials in Transport Scotland. These people are crucial to all aspects of the delivery and operation of our ferries. They often go above and beyond to maintain and enhance services and infrastructure, the role has been key in the past and it will continue to be so in the future. We have a good track record of providing high value, high skill job opportunities to people from remote and rural island communities, offering people lifelong career progression. And during my engagements and visits this summer, I've met many who started their careers young and who have worked their way up to senior positions, staying and maintaining their lives in rural and island towns. That feels and looks like success to me. And it is a success that I want to build on to provide more such opportunities in the future for young people from island and remote communities. But I also know that increasingly ferry employees and the crew often bear the brunt of people's frustration, with many experiencing verbal abuse and intimidation, as I heard on my visit to Oban last month. That is not and will never be acceptable. There is more that we can do to nurture a culture of respect between passengers and staff, even across this chamber. It's too easy for politicians to ramp up the rhetoric, to play fast and loose around the facts and to encourage headline-grabbing media stories without, about our ferries, 
being broken, giving the completely wrong impression that our islands are closed and unreachable in some instances. The statistics don't bear that out, and indeed there has been some evidence anecdotally of inaccurate perception becoming reality. Responsible, constructive debate and critique is possible, desirable and indeed essential. More light, less heat is surely what we should all be seeking. I therefore look forward to hearing from all members today about their constructive ideas and views on how we can create that sustainable, resilient ferry service in the future. And that will help island residents, community and businesses to thrive. Most surely, that has to be our shared goal. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Minister. The Minister will now take uh, questions on the issues raised in her statement. I intend to allow uh, around 20 minutes for that, at which point we'll need to move to the next item of business. As ever, if members wish to ask a question, I'd invite them to press the request to speak uh, buttons now or as soon as possible. And I call first Graham Simpson. Thank you very much. Um, can I thank the Minister for advance sight of her statement uh, and the long-awaited Project Neptune report? I first asked her to release the report on February the 24th, and she said she would. Um, had she released it then, I might have had time to digest it by now, because it is quite a heavy read. And she recognises that in her statement. Had it been shared earlier, uh, we could have had the kind of discussions that I'm sure, I'm absolutely certain, the Minister wants to have. And I'll take part in any talks that she wants to set up, it would be hugely beneficial if we could all agree on what changes are needed to the way we do ferries. The clunky governance structure should change. It doesn't make sense to have the Minister, Transport Scotland, CMAL and CalMAC. It's not delivering for islanders. So does the Minister agree with that and will she commit to changing the structure? I'm not asking her what she wants that structure to be. Does she think it should change? I want to ask her about timescales because there was nothing in her statement about that. So what's her deadline for reform? Uh, what's her deadline for putting a new West Coast contract out to tender because we're up against the clock on that? And also, what's her deadline for announcing a ramped up ferry replacement programme because that's what we essentially need so that we can uh, improve ferries and get new ferries every single year. Thank you. Minister. Uh, I thank Mr Simpson for his question and the, and the tone of uh, his question additionally. Um, he is correct. I, I did give him an undertaking earlier this year that I would publish the report, and I'm glad that he's welcomed that today. Um, I think it's really important to remember that there are a number of different organisations involved in the delivery of ferry services just now, so it was essential we got that right, and there are sensitivities involved in that. And I want to, again, put on record a reassurance to those organisations today that nothing will be happening overnight. But we will now have those discussions. I cannot say on record whether or not we all reach agreement, but you have an undertaking from me that I want to work with parties across the chamber on what future delivery should look like. But it's not just about us. It's about island communities and it's about trade unions. It's about staff who work in these organisations too. And I think that's hugely important to, to recognise. Mr Simpson mentioned the clunky governance structure. Um, I think to some extent I would agree with him. We have, and the report uh, you know, illustrates this in more detail, um, a complex structure currently in operation, which isn't beneficial, I don't think, to island communities at times, and I certainly don't think it's beneficial to ministers either. Um, so I would agree with him to that extent. On the Chiefs 3 contract, I'm not going to update the Chamber on that. I am aware, of course, we are approaching the end of that contract. Any future decision on that will have to be considered, and I'm sure we'll have further conversations on that throughout the course of this afternoon. In relation to the future plan, though, I think that's what islanders need to hear about next. That's why I'll come back to the Chamber for that wider debate on next steps, but also in terms of the island's connectivity plan, which sets out some of that detail in more progress and will give people dates and opportunity to look forward to a timeline of investment coming down uh, the track, which will allow them to be hopeful for the future. In the interim period, and again, I'm sure we'll come to this later today, it, there is a requirement on government to look at what more we might be able to do in the interim around about second-hand tonnage and where we can bring opportunities there to bear that I'm looking at 
all opportunities at this present moment in time. He will be aware of the Loch Freesia, which was brought into the fleet in June. And of course, uh, we will have additional tonnage coming from 801 and 802 and the Isla vessels later. But there is a, a challenge just now in terms of having that additional vessel in the fleet. And I'm very live to looking at opportunities to bring about that investment. Thank you, Minister. I'm conscious at the last statement, um, the presiding officer wasn't able to get in everybody that wanted to ask a question. I'm determined that this is not going to happen in relation to this or the subsequent statement. So I'd be grateful for succinct questions and more succinct answers as well, Minister. Thank you. Neil Bibby. Thank you, President Officer, and I thank the Minister for advance sight of her statement. The serious problems with Scotland's ferries have gone on far too long, and the ultimate responsibility for this lies with the Scottish Government. But we will, of course, work with the Minister to try and fix it. We cannot afford to make a bad situation even worse, and that is why Scottish Labour welcomes the commitment to rule out privatisation and the unbundling of routes on the Clyde and Hebrides network. Can I ask the Minister, though, why a report was commissioned and paid for by the Scottish Government to tell them to privatise CalMac and unbundle routes in the first place. Of course, if there is a tendering process, privatisation is evidently still possible. Can the Minister therefore confirm there will not be a costly tendering process for the Clyde and Hebrides network? Well, we need to look at the governance structures. The Scottish Government cannot distract us from the fact islanders have an unreliable ferry service, mainly because we have an unreliable ferry fleet. It is therefore disappointing and not surprising that this statement on the future of Scottish ferries does not give islanders one single more Scottish ferry. Can I therefore ask the Minister when will capacity be increased, by how much and on what routes? And while I believe Ukrainian refugees should be housed in homes rather than on ferries, it proves the Scottish Government can charter ferries at short notice. Why have ferries not been chartered for Scotland's islands before now? And finally, Minister, will Minister, the delayed and unfinished ferries at Minister, be ready on the new time scales? Mr Bibby, Minister. I thank Neil Bibby for his question. He covered a number of points, so I'll try to, to address those in detail. Um, first of all, in relation to responsibility, I, I accept responsibility as Minister for Transport. That's why I'm here today sharing the report. Of course, this report shouldn't be taken on its own. We already have had a report from the uh, Rural and Economy Committee last session. We've had the public, uh, the Audit Scotland rather, report. We now have Project Neptune. There are two further inquiries running um, in parliamentary committees at this moment in time. But I think it is important we have cross-party consensus where that's possible on a way forward. Um, in terms of the remit given to Ernst & Young, nothing was ruled out at that time. I appreciate and accept that that has concerned people, but I hope that given the First Minister's expression on this and my own, we will not be pursuing any routes that look to privatisation in the future, nor will we be considering uh, unbundling. I appreciate what Mr Bibby has said, though, but the remit given to Ernst & Young was wide, and that is why it's included in the report. And I would encourage Mr Bibby to look at the detail in the future section of the report, which actually is critical at times of the privatisation option, again, strengthening, I think, um, our belief, certainly in this government, on privatisation. On shifts three, Mr Bibby asked me to, um, I think, rule out that it would go out to tender. I believe that it's important that communities are consulted as part of any future delivery model. And I think Mr Youssef was on record in 2017 in saying that if we were to pursue, for example, direct award in the future, we could only do so if and when island communities were content to do that. Now, I've announced today that Angus Campbell will lead some of the next steps in terms of consultation, but I'd be keen to speak to, and I will be speaking to Mr Campbell early next week, around about how we can better consult communities on their views on direct award, because I think that's hugely Minister, I'm going to have to ask you to um, wrap up, please. Thank you. Alistair Allen to be followed by Jamie Green. Uh, the Minister will be aware of the long-standing desire of communities in North Uist and Harris to be served by a dedicated vessel each rather than to share a vessel. Uh, this would bring numerous benefits. What can the government do to engage with communities and develop a proper case for such an arrangement? Minister. Uh, I thank Dr Allen for his question and would again reiterate that that option is actively being looked at. And in recent engagement with the community and stakeholders, I've alerted them to that work. I think actually earlier this year when I was in Mr Allen's constituency, I spoke to a number of stakeholders on this very point in Harris. I will, of course, continue to keep communities updated as to the progress on those developments. Officials have recently received a very helpful study undertaken by the Loch Boysdale Ferry Business Impact Group as part of this work. And they have also been speaking to the local authority about the assessments that they've commissioned. 
I would encourage more to give that sort of information and share it with uh, government where they're able to. And I know Dr Allen will keep encouraging his constituents to engage with this process so a fully developed case can be considered. But I want to give him a reassurance that this option is actively being considered at the present time. Jimmy Green to be followed by Fiona Hislop. Thank you. Uh, I welcome today's uh, statement, but what we don't have is a firm commitment to procure and build new ferries. And given that we know how long it takes to design, to procure, to build, to manufacture, to fund them properly, to replace the current fleet of ferries, we need to be start building them now. When will we actually see a firm plan so that our islands have some faith that the government will be replacing those ferries and we, history won't be repeating itself in five or ten years' time? Minister. Um, I thank Mr Green for his question. In relation to additional tonnage, he will understand that if there are commercial discussions ongoing at this moment in time, I'm not able to say publicly where we are in that respect. However, I am hopeful that in the coming weeks we will be able to say more on that very point. Because as we go into winter, I recognise there is a level of anxiety in our island communities and I want to give them a reassurance. The best way we could do that is to bring in an additional vessel. So I, want to, I hope that that's given him a level of assurance, although I am not able to give more detail, as I wouldn't have been able to, to Mr Bibby, in relation to those commercial discussions which are ongoing at the present time. Fiona Hislop to be followed by Rhoda Grant. Does the Minister recognise the view that this review of governance of the publicly owned ferry set-up is long overdue after two decades of devolution? And as part of the next steps in response to this re report, how will the Scottish Government ensure that there is more transparency and accountability built in? Unlike roads, ferry provision is not underpinned by a statutory framework. Is it not time to change that as a legislative framework would provide greater clarity and accountability, which is what the public and communities served by ferries are doing? demanding and Minister. should expect. Uh, Officer, I agree with Fiona Hislop. This review of governance was much needed and it's really important that we consider all of the findings and recommendations to make sure that what we do in terms of reform makes the improvements to delivery and governance that we and island communities ultimately need to see. That includes how we best demonstrate transparency, public value and accountability including, of course, governance. As I set out in my statement, we have made improvements already to some of the uh, issues addressed by the uh, findings within the tripartite itself. But I do accept that more needs to happen. Engagement with stakeholders is really vital then in terms of those next steps. That includes employees, of course, and unions, because we want to take staff with us, and of course, with communities, residents and businesses. And I want us to produce those improvements that not only make sense, but also provide more clarity on who is responsible and accountable under the current arrangements. Rhoda Grant to be followed by Kenneth Gibson. Ferry disruptions impact on the economy, leading to cancellations by tourists, freight being delayed, and people being stranded at terminals overnight. Can I therefore ask what's been put in place to help people stranded because of cancellations and for the businesses impacted? And will she give a commitment that there will be no reduction in capacity to and from Harrison US during the winter closures and no disruption during the summer months while the work at Uig Harbour is being progressed? Minister. I thank Rhoda Grant for her question. She touched on a number of points. First of all, in relation to people being stranded, of course, this wouldn't just be a role for Transport Scotland. There would be a role locally for the Local Resilience Partnership. That's why I think it's really important that we have a cross-government approach. So we have officials from the Cabinet Secretary for Rural Affairs and Islands side of uh, the House, as it were. But we also draw in the expertise of resilience officials from Mr Brown's side um, of government. And I think that's hugely important. We have a holistic and well-informed uh, piece in government, which better equips us to provide support when people are stranded. Of course, CalMAC have a, a level of responsibility here too. Um, I've completely forgotten the second part of Ms Grant's question. I apologise. I'm sure you can follow up in writing. Kenneth Gibson to be followed by Willie Rennie. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Does the Minister share my disappointment at the intransigence of Peel Ports, who have dragged their feet on the upgrade of Adrosson Harbour since 2015? And can she confirm that while the long term mainland port for Brodick is Adrosson, the Scottish Government is committed to the people and communities of Anne by investing with associated British ports £3.6 million in Troon to ensure the Glen Silex can sail to Brodick from next spring? Minister. Yes, I do share uh, Kenneth Gibson's disappointment that we have not been able to make progress on the works at our Dross, and particularly given how much time has passed. We are frustrated, of course, in government. I am certainly frustrated at the lack of progress. Now, as Mr Gibson indicates, one of the issues here is that we do not own the port, and I mentioned some of this in my statement, so the complexities around the legal and commercial arrangements have been very challenging. Although all parties are now back around the table on this matter, that's certainly welcome, and I hope we can now make that rapid progress we need to see. But there are limits to ministers and indeed the community's patience. 
I am pleased that work is almost complete at Troon to allow the vessel to operate there in the interim until our drawstone is complete. And having invested in improvements at the harbour to allow this short-term activity to be undertaken, it feels appropriate to consider a longer-term purpose for Troon Harbour. So it would be our intention to use Troon Harbour as an alternative port of refuge in the longer term. Willie Rennie to be followed by Stuart McMillan. Uh, we will work constructively on this. But there is a, an inference in the Minister's statement that the current terrible state of the ferry service is in part a result of the tripartite structure. Is she really saying that? And if that is the case, why is the pace of reform not more urgent? Minister. Well, I don't actually accept that's what um, I updated the Chamber with uh, this afternoon. If M Willie Rennie has read the report, he will realise the report is about the tripartite structure, which is why it was the central feature of my statement to Parliament. I welcome his offer to work constructively. Um, I don't accept it's all to do with the tripartite structure. I do accept, though, that the tripartite structure brings challenge. And uh, if and when Mr Rennie reads the report, he will recognise some of that challenge in further detail. It's hugely important that we have a, a structure of governance that works for people. But there are wider challenges on the network just now in terms of that additional tonnage, as I mentioned in my answer to... Uh, Jamie Green earlier on. So uh, I recognise this is not just about the tripartite structure, but this afternoon we are discussing a report which focuses on governance, and that's why it's been the focus of this afternoon's statement. Stuart McMillan to be followed by Ariane Burgess. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can the Minister provide any further assurance about measures to improve the short term resilience of the existing fleet this winter? Minister. Um, on infrastructure, I can confirm that we will complete the Sky Triangle port investments at Tarbert and Loch Maddy by spring 23 and at Uig by spring 24. And in the coming year, we will also upgrade uh, infrastructure at five ports for Isla vessels and progress construction of the two new Isla vessels too. We will progress work to improve harbour infrastructure for Arran services, as I've just indicated. And we'll have a temporary solution in place at Troon to ensure the MV Glen Sanex can operate. And as the Minister for Business, Trade, Tourism and Enterprise confirmed on Tuesday, we expect the Glen Sanex to be delivered in spring of 23. On Mr McMillan's second point, there is a lot of work underway to try and improve resilience in the short term. I've just announced that we will pay for and fund weather monitoring equipment at harbours owned by third parties, including Stornoway, Lismore, uh, Leverborough and Edisgay. Ariane Burgess to be followed by Donald Cameron. Can the Minister expand on how we ensure the interests of island communities, including as full a range of voices as possible, will be at the forefront of decision making going forward? Minister. I think it's absolutely essential that we involve young people in the next steps in delivery. And to that end, I will be discussing this further with uh, Angus Campbell next week in terms of how we can get that broad range of views uh, in informing our future next steps. Thank you. Donald Cameron to be followed by Jenny Minto. Residents on Harris remain worried that they won't have a ferry service during the 14-week closure of the UIG Pier on Sky next year. Fresh concerns have been raised that there may be a further 12-week period of disruption in addition. Can the Minister assure residents and businesses on Harris that there won't be any additional disruption? And will she explore securing a temporary ferry service for Harris during the period of closure? Minister. I'm more than happy to answer questions on the situation in Harris. Um, Mr Cameron may know I've spent a lot of time with the community in Harris since I visited in April, trying to find a better mitigation for that outage, because, of course, the original plans for Harris would have seen a six-month closure of the port, which I don't think was sustainable for island residents. Where we are now is we will have a split in terms of the outage period that will be reduced from 24 weeks, which was the original plan period, to 14 over two shorter periods. This has involved a lot of work by CMAL Highland Council, who are leading on the work, CalMAC and Transport Scotland, but also, importantly, engagement with local communities. In relation to the risks he's highlighted, I have heard these risks, but I've been really keen to work with the community to reassure them. And on Tuesday of this week, I convened a resilience meeting with the community and all partners involved in the project. And CalMAC gave an absolute... Uh, assurance that there should not be any more impacts to the network in terms of what regularly runs on the route. So this should not adversely affect the service delivery. In terms of the outage period itself, uh, Mr Cameron asked for an additional vessel. Again, as I said, I think in my response to Mr Green, I hope to be able to say more on that in the coming weeks. Jenny Minto to be followed by Beatrice Wisher. Thank you, Presiding Officer. As an Isla resident, I welcome the Minister's commitments today, especially to improve communication with local island communities and businesses. We also need to ensure that more islanders are more involved with decision making on lifeline ferry services. So can the minister advise what can be done to improve that? And I'd also like to take this opportunity to invite the minister to Isla. Minister. I'll gladly accept that invitation from Ms Minto. I'm, I'm sure that she will, like me, be delighted that Angus Campbell has agreed to support the engagement work on next steps. 
We are all agreed that including and hearing from the views and experiences of people, businesses and communities on our islands is key, not just for our islands, but on the more rural uh, and remote communities that are connected by ferry to our islands themselves. Now, my predecessor, Mr Day, made a commitment to look at how we could improve um, people with island experience in board appointments, and I undertook to take forward that commitment. I agree wholeheartedly with Ms Minto that we need more islanders involved with decision-making on lifeline ferry services. To that end, um, I can confirm today that the appointment of Murdo McClellan to the board of uh, CMAL. Murdo is from the Western Isles and has a wealth of experience to bring to the board. And very briefly, Beatrice Wisher. The west coast of Scotland is not the only location where there's a need for extra tonnage. The Northern Isles face known pinch points like the current livestock sales seasons. The Transport Minister indicates that government needs to do better, but what then can the Minister say to businesses in Shetland who have learned that a recent opportunity to charter a suitable vessel to alleviate the situation was rejected by the service operator of the Northern Isles Ferries contract? Minister. Uh, I thank Mrs Wisher for her, her question. Um, she may be aware that I discussed this issue um, at length with Shetland Isles Council and other stakeholders when I visited last month, and I recognise some of the real challenges for businesses during the busy livestock season. Now, I am told that a freight vessel was identified late in the process, despite an earlier approach from Circle to the owner. But given existing capacity on the current services, they have not pursued this option at this time. I am more than happy to write to the member in more detail, though, on that point, because I recognise some of the challenge that was raised with me by stakeholders when I was in Shetland just last month. Thank you. That concludes this item of business. There will be a brief pause before we move to the next item.